Hello, uh, very warm welcome to Progress Junior Golf with Live Sport Now and the England Golf Young Ambassadors. Uh, my name is Steve Jackson and this is Ian Waterhouse. Steve Jackson, how are you? It's great to see you again. In fact, it's only been a week, hasn't it, since we last uh, saw it? Each always other feels on. longer though, doesn't it? But yes, it's been it's been just a week. But we, it was important that we had another podcast as quick as possible because we're coming towards the end of the goal season and and you know we went three weeks without one, so let's get two in two weeks then, shall we? So yeah. Right. Now, this podcast is all about junior golf. It's about the next generation of golfers. It's about getting more boys and girls playing the game of golf. This is the 22nd Progress Junior Golf podcast. So um, I got it right season. this week. I got it right this yes, week. Well done. Correct. Oh, correct. Last yes. week I got it wrong. <laughs> yes, you can count to 22. Congratulations. Yes. Now, this evening, we're going to be looking at one of the biggest topics, not just in golf, not just in sport, but in the world, really, because we're going yeah. to be looking at climate change and in particular sustainability and sustainability in golf, in the golf industry. Now, it's obviously a topic that is, well, it doesn't just cover sport. It covers everything, nearly. But the people who are going to benefit the most, let's be honest, not me and you, Ian, but it's yeah. going to be the ones to the next generation, the younger kids, because they're the ones who are going to have to, dare I say it, they're going to have to bear the brunt of what we do now kind of thing. So it's important that we get... The juniors involved and the youngsters involved to make sure that we make the right decisions for them so join us live in the studio to help us out is going to be england golf young ambassador alex holding and we're also going to hear from executive director geo foundation for sustainable golf jonathan smith that's a pre-recorded interview with him we're going to get clips and we're going to get alex's view of exactly what's going on within the golf industry so massive massive topic um which spreads not just through golf but in, in other industries as well, of course. Absolutely. I will say as well, Stu, it is such a vast topic. Uh, but if you do have a question or you want to have your say, please comment below. We actually want to know what your golf clubs are doing uh, as well. So please comment. Tell us. If you head over to uh, Live Sport Now on YouTube, there's a link in the body of this broadcast. If you comment in the chat section, we can actually bring your comment on screen. How cool is that? So tell us, what is your golf club doing? to uh, really have a positive effect on sustainability. We want to hear from you, so please do comment below. As Steve says, what we do today influences and is going to have a major impact on the junior golfers coming through now. It's a, such a huge subject, not just in golf, but everywhere. But this is a golf podcast, Steve. Absolutely. So first things first, though, let's get the, the junior golf news then sorted. Um, as you can appreciate, this time of the year, kids are back at school so there's not been that many golf competitions a few at the weekends and a few golf tours have had their events so but there's been some student competitions um so we'll start with those then um been one big one over in france this just finished today actually uh at the golf national which of course hosted the the Ryder cup a few years ago uh three swedish players finished first second and third in the boys competition Jesper Litterin uh, won with a three under par score, played over three rounds, 72, 69, 70, won by one shot from William Liu and Hugo Stark. Really came down to the last two holes. It was very, very tight. He parred the last two holes and the other two players, they, they dropped a few shots in the last couple of holes and that's the reason why he went on to win there. The girls' competition was won by Lorna McClymont, uh, another name which has cropped up on a few occasions uh, in the podcast over the last year or so. And one by distance as well. She finished one over par, one by 12 shots uh, from Megan Giles. And in third place was Darcy Harry. She shot 75, 71, 70. So it got better as the week went on. So so well on to her. Uh, actually, before, before, before you move on, Steve, before you move on, I've just got a quick on. question for you. I'm not an expert in French golf courses. Um, right. Obviously, I know the Golf National. And, yes. um I've had the pleasure of interviewing the uh, golf, the French Golf Federation president uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and of course, we talked the Golf National, we talked about the Ryder Cup, etc. And now we've spoken about heading over to France a few times on the podcast for tournaments in the news section. And we only ever go to the Golf National. I mean, <laughs> is there literally just one golf course in France? <laughs> um no, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I jest, of course. It's just I know the Golf National is something special, isn't it? It's it's sort of France's Augusta, I suppose. But um, yeah, yeah, we just we never seem to go anywhere else. It's always the Golf National when there's a when there's a tournament on. 
<laughs> to be fair to, to be fair to them, they've been holding some really big competitions over the last two or three weeks or so. So that's the reason why they've been mentioned a little bit more than others. But but I'm sure there are if there are any French golf clubs listening to this or watching this, then please get in touch. We'd like to hear about your junior golf news if you've got anything to tell please us. Please do. And if you Just want to invite me and Steve for a round, we'll, absolutely. We'll come over. <laughs> well, yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. We, we we won't we're not gonna turn you down. Right, staying with we're staying with them um, students golf though. Uh actually the, the person who finished first and second in this both played in that competition over in France. Uh this was a week ago. The Irish Inv- Inter Varsity Championship took place at Ross Lair Golf Club. The winner, I think we've got a photo. Uh Kate Dwyer won the competition. Um I, I love the photo, not necessarily because of her. I just love the, his face. Whoever is the happiest man ever, doesn't he? Absolutely. You know, the fact that he, he managed to give away the trophy today. So I, I love that photo. But um, yeah, Kate Dwyer won. Uh, she was the only player who actually finished under par. Second place was Ryan Griffin. Third was Shane Irwin. And you mentioned the previous competition that came out of the last two holes. This came down to the last hole. And if I told you that Ryan Griffin eagled the 18th hole, oh. so did Shane Irwin eagle the 18th hole. So nothing like putting the pressure on. Katie Dwyer, she birded the 18th hole to win by one shot. So well done, oh, well done to Katie. Talk for, about actually, pressure, yeah, absolutely. Kate, well yeah, done, absolutely. well done to Katie. Yes. Um, Saying so student golf then, up in Fife, so Scotland north of the border this time, the British universities and colleges sport, they played their final at Fairmont uh, on the Torrance course, of course, a place where we know we've been earlier this year. Another foreign winner of this one, Judd Sunderson, uh, from South Africa won. He was the only player, the only boy anyway, who finished under par. One under par, he finished 74, 69, 72 for his three rounds. Uh, second place, joint second was William Squires and Matthew Giles. Now, you know me as a journalist. I always look for what the actual story, the angle of the story was. And I was looking at the scorecards. The interesting thing about it was 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 what Judd's scores were on the par five holes. Because four par five holes there. The third hole, he did birdie par bogey. So a little bit inconsistent. But he was super consistent on the other three holes. The sixth hole, three holes, all three birdies ah. on all three days. Twelfth hole, three bogeys, all three days. And the eighteenth hole, three pars, all three days. So there's consistency for you. So um so I, I know which those. three I'd rather have. Absolutely, long. yeah. <laughs> uh, to be fair, I'd, I'd set up for the three bogeys, but there you go. So, <laughs> yeah, so would I. <laughs> yes, girls' competition. Then uh, that was won by Lucy and Mazding uh, from Noel Park. She won by one shot from Kira Barnes um, from St Enadoc. Actually, St Enadoc as well. I did notice this week that they've won an award for their sustainability. So, well done, St Enadoc oh, as well. Yeah. Obviously, very relevant for what we're going to be talking about here as well today. So, um, staying in Scotland, then the Paul Laurie Golf Foundation. We've got a photo. Um, which was put on um, on uh, Twitter. Uh, the Academy Finals Day took place at Blair Rowry Golf Club. Um, the tweet which was sent out by Paul Laurie included this photo, and he said, congratulations to everyone involved, and well done to the winners from the South region. Now, I've been being brutally honest, I couldn't find the results from this competition, so I wasn't sure who the players were who were representing the South region or even which clubs within that South region, but by the sounds of it, the South region won. So congratulations to them. The only and thing course, I, I can tell there, that bloke in the grey jacket in the middle, he's not a junior golfer. No, he's uh, <laughs> he, he he might be, he might be Paul Laurie. You never know. So um, he and actually, stay in, there either, does he? <laughs> no, 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 of course not. And actually, along the same theme, we've got another couple of big events coming up, which do involve some very very big names. Of course, Paul Laurie, former Ryder Cup player, former Open champion. Well, we've got coming up, we've got the Justin Rose Telegraph Junior Golf Championship. That takes place at Quinta de Lago uh, from October the 31st to November the 4th. And wow, got some names playing in this competition. 12 boys and 12 girls in the gross competition. So if I give you the, I'll give you the handicap, shall I, the boys. Plus four, 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 plus three, plus two, plus two, plus one. Scratch and scratch. So the worst player in the competition, if worse is the right word to use, is a scratch golfer. Now, the interesting thing about it is he's the youngest player, a lad called Oliver Smith. He also might well be the favourite. And the reason why I say that in a weird way is because it's being played at Quinta de Lago and that's his home club. So watch out for him. I think he might do quite well in that. Um, just to give you an idea of some of the other names in that, Harley Smith, Jack Lee, Oliver Mercogee, you know, names yeah. who we regularly mention on this. Girls competition. I said the handicaps were pretty good with the boys. Girls handicaps, plus five, plus five, plus five, plus four, plus three. Plus three, plus two, plus two, plus one, plus one, and plus one. And there's one player playing off scratch. <laughs> Who is it? So, once again, all fantastic. And once again, some names we're, we're very familiar with, the likes of Roisin, Scanlon, 
yeah. Sophia Fulbrook, Amelia Wham, youngest player once again, 14 year old Charlotte Norton. So, so right the way through the age, you know, very yeah. young players playing in that. Uh, there is a net competition as well, six players playing in that as well. Um, I think the two names I'll pick out there are James Bowler and Alice Taylor. There's two boys, three girls, three boys in that competition. The reason why I picked those two uh, is because they're both on the same club. So, Camberley Hill, congratulations to them, the fact that you've managed to get two players to play in that uh, in that final. So, best of luck for everyone who's uh, going over to Portugal to play in that competition. Another massive event overseas coming up, the Faldo Series. That's coming up uh, at the UAE, uh, November the 1st to the 3rd. I'm going to be there. We're going to do an interview with Nick Faldo. Uh, so, Nick Faldo, anyone who has any questions which you want me to put across to Sir Nick, then please get in touch with us, info at progressjuniorgolf.com. We have already had some people who've been in touch who've put some questions, so and very interesting questions as well for Sir Nick. So looking forward to, to getting that to him. That will be our next podcast, which takes place on Wednesday, November the 9th. So it'll be a special one. Mm. Us one. getting some questions from the juniors and then putting them to Sir Nick. So it'll be fascinating to get his, uh, his views on that. And just finally, then, the Gold Foundation. So staying with the theme of, of top players, um, the Gold Foundation have their 70th anniversary awards at the London Golf Club. Um, and Sky Sports presenter Nick Doherty, he was unveiled as the organisation's new president on the day. So basically the event was to pay tribute to those individuals and organisations who have made an impact on growing the game at junior level. Uh, five awards were given out. Uh, the Stephen Proctor Award for Making Golf Inclusive to All Young People. That was won by Baygarf uh, Academy. That's up in North Lincolnshire. The Charles Harrison Award for... Well, basically introducing uh, thousands of young people to golf. That went to Ivan Oliver from Scarborough South Cliff Golf Club. Um, the Sir Henry Cotton Award was for services to junior golf over a sustained period. Uh, we're talking about sustained golf. This, this is someone who's worked a lot on developing junior golf. But actually, when we were up in Scotland, if you remember, uh, for the Fowler Series earlier this season, Ian, this was a name which cropped up whilst I was up there. I was talking to a few different people. David Warren, who runs the East Lothian Junior Golf League, when I was over at North Berwick having a chat with him about junior golf, this name cropped up, and you can tell why he's won this award. So congratulations to David. Uh, two of the awards, the Dina Oxley Young Spirit of Golf Award. That's for an outstanding impact. That's actually from a junior golfer. That went to Tilly Garford and from Woodall Spa Golf Club. Oh, and the Junior Club of the Year, which quite a I can imagine this must be a competitive award, this one, because I could think of thousands of clubs which could, which could quite yeah. easily get this award. It went to Great Torrington down in North Devon. So congratulations to them and congratulations to all the winners there. And congratulations as well to the Golf Foundation. They do hang, a hang on, though, Steve. Hang on, let me, just, let me just check our trophy cabinet for the junior yes. podcast, junior golf podcast for doing so. For... They didn't do ah, a junior podcast of the year 70. award this year. That's for next, <laughs> that's for next year, next year's <laughs> award. So... If you're picking up on the hint, the Gold Foundation, we're in, we're in the running. We're, we're just looking for yeah. just, <laughs> just one, yes. Just one. Doesn't even well, have to be for the podcast, you know. Just, just a trophy. <laughs> Maybe having biggest nose or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Pinocchio. Yes. Right now, that wraps, that wraps up the Junior Golf News. We are going to be talking about our podcast today, which is about sustainability of golf. We're going to get a live guest on in a second, but just before we do that, Ian, just, just your thoughts on sustainability of golf and and where we are as far as that is concerned within the industry well do you know what steve as you know i'm involved in a number of other sports one of them is motorsport and of course motorsport when it comes to sustainability uh gets a bit of a bad rap at times but they're pushing really really hard i always thought golf actually it's quite an environmentally friendly game isn't it really uh d does golf really what does golf need to do really i mean it's it's like everything reducing carbon footprint etc etc <sighs> Everybody's trying to get zero emissions. Everybody's trying to get, you know, carbon neutral, et cetera, et cetera. Um, your, your average club, I, I think they're probably pretty good already, to be honest. I, I think, again, the influence needs to come from the top. Uh, as I always say this in all sports, every sport I've ever been involved in, the influence comes down from the top and then feeds down from there. So for me, I'm looking at PGA Tour. I'm looking at DP World Tour. I'm looking at Live Golf. What are they going to do to make the difference and then feed it down and, and have that clear pathway on a sustainability path that we can then follow and uh, put into place? 
Now I look at it the other way around and I look at it from the juniors upwards. So I'm looking for them to influence the bigger boys as well. So, and that's what we're going to do here today. We're going to hopefully give, give some of those clubs, some of those golf unions, some of those golf organisations, some of those golf tools you mentioned there. Let's give them a few ideas. Let's get some, you know, some things out there which which they need to do kind of thing and we've got a couple of important guests on to talk about this subject so let's get the first one on live on the show that's england golf young ambassador alex holden and then we'll also have an interview with uh, the geo foundation for sustainable golf their chief their executive director jonathan smith and then we'll get um alex's thoughts as and when we hear from um from jonathan so i'm going to drop there? out he is. I'm going to drop out. I'll bring him in. Don't forget, though, do comment below if you have a question or just want to have your say. What is your club doing? We want to hear from you. Here's Alex. Good evening, Alex. How are we this evening? Good evening, Steve. I'm all good. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm OK. I'm OK. Now, obviously, we are going to be talking about sustainability in golf. Um, we are going to get an interview and we're going to get your thoughts on what uh, the GEO Foundation for Sustainable Golf what they do and, and, and the kind of impact that they have having on the golf industry. Just as a general point, though, how important is this subject for for junior golfers in particular? Yeah, great, great question, Steve. Um, I think, you know, young, young people have a great opportunity to speak up about this and to start the conversations within their clubs if they haven't started already. Um, you know, most most golf clubs have a, a solid junior section these days. Um, so, you know, getting getting an education out there, uh, increasing awareness amongst young people um, will allow us to be able to speak more to older people and anyone else in the club about the topic, um, bring it into the picture, have better conversations, um, better understanding, and then allow more action to be taken uh, on a local scale, but also globally, because we know that it's a global, you know, climate change is a global issue. Um, so I think it's, you know, juniors are in a great position to, to come into the conversation, drive that conversation, um, and look at making an impact, a positive impact. Um, and I think that's that's the ultimate goal really here is to to make golf uh, more sustainable uh, and to be a leader in the space of, of sport, um, you know, given that nature is at the heart of, of golf. Um, so yeah, there's, there's many opportunities here um, and junior golfers are definitely able to, to, to come into that picture. And I made the point right at the start of this podcast, the fact that, you know, with the greatest respect to Ian and myself, it's not about us. It's about it's about the younger ones because they're the ones who are going to be the ones who hopefully benefit or don't if it goes the wrong way. So it's so it is so important, the fact that we do listen to to, to your point of view, because you're the ones who are going to be affected for, for the, more than anyone, really. Yeah, I think I think, you know, yes, we might be affected slightly more, but I, I, it comes down to everyone taking their own responsibility. Um, it's individual responsibility. So, yes, we. You know, juniors can drive that conversation, but it really needs everyone to be part of that conversation. So, you know, great, great. Let's platform juniors more. Um, let's get them on the committee. Let's let's get sustainability on committee agendas. Um, but let's also make sure that everyone's part of that conversation because we can't have it polarized where some people want to talk about it, like young people, and and other people doesn't necessarily have to be by age don't want to talk about it because everyone has to take an interest to to be able to make the changes on a local level. Um, and it's only those you know, cumulative local. Um, contributions where we're going to see a change on a global scale so yeah it's really important for everyone okay so we obviously have got an interview with the geo foundation for sustainable golf executive director jonathan smith simple question i asked him first of all is is what exactly is the geo foundation for sustainable golf and what do they do Foundation for Sustainable Golf was founded 15 years ago uh, with a dedicated purpose to help uh, golf with sustainability, to actually act a little bit like a caddy um, for the sport, to understand the landscape of sustainability and to build some uh, tools and solutions and provide some support to the industry to help accelerate uh, the movement in sustainability within golf, but, but not just within golf, also through golf. I mean, the more sustainable golf is, uh, golf obviously reaches a lot of people and it can inspire and sort of uh, share sustainability in lots and lots of different ways with fans and in local communities. So our mission was about helping golf with sustainability, but helping um, sustainability develop much more widely through the sport of golf because of golf's reach. Uh, and we've been doing that as a non-profit organization. We've got no commercial interest in this at all. Uh, our mission is just to, to help advance sustainability uh, in the sport and through the sport. Now, obviously, that's a that's a massive job to do, if you like. So, how how do you even start going about doing that? Well, so it it has to be a big collective exercise. Sustainability. There's no one uh, golf club. There's no one golf organization. There's no one sport. There's no one sector. 
uh, that can tackle some of these big issues that we all face, you know, and, and they're global issues and local issues in sustainability. So it has to be a team effort. And and really, you know, uh, we work very collaboratively. It's not about uh, what the foundation can achieve. It's about what we can help uh, parts of golf achieve. So we work with governing bodies like the RNA, who have a very strong leadership program themselves in sustainability. We work with national federations and associations like Wales Golf, Scottish Golf, England Golf, Greenkeepers Associations, really trying to um, help support them as they take sustainability out to their members um, and sort of pass that through to, to more and more clubs, more and more tournaments, um, and, and actually also down into, into golfers' awareness. Can you can you give some examples then of of, of the of the type of things which which you have done with with clubs and and, and golfers to, to 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 bring about more sustainability? Yeah, so um, what what we've done with a lot of golf associations uh, input is to develop things like best practice guidelines for key aspects of sustainability. And when we talk about sustainability, it's maybe worth saying um, the way that we've sort of boiled that complex word down is for golf to talk about how can golf foster nature. How can golf conserve resources? How can golf help strengthen communities? That's the social sort of responsibility part. And how can golf take climate action? So we've boiled sustainability down into four kind of action areas, four topics for golf. And what we're seeing and what we've what we've built around that are some guidelines. We've built some programs that golf clubs can uh, join and, and um, uh, use to guide them. Uh, we've built uh, awards and certifications, so to give people recognition when they when they deserve recognition for their sustainability work, and then really working with golf associations to take that out and engage clubs and engage uh, golf tournaments and offer that support, offer those guidelines, offer those programs and tools, and offer that certification and those awards out to the industry, and and you know we've seen quite a lot of progress. We've seen um, in the UK. Um, around about 250 to 300 golf clubs now participating in one of those programs. Um, there's a whole bundle of uh, some of the sort of uh, very well-known and less well-known golf clubs across the UK that are now fully certified or have environmental awards. Those clubs are really doing some inspiring stuff. Um, we have now over 1,700 sustainability highlights from golf clubs, and they're on our website, actually, at sustainable.golf. You can come and read about the very, very often quite simple and practical things that golf clubs are doing. So in the nature bucket, it's about letting some grass grow, planting some trees, joining up some trees to create a small woodland, uh, letting some wetlands emerge around the, around the pond edges, because that's really important for the ecology. Um, being really careful with any fertilizer use or chemical use on the golf course so that it's it's minimalized and, and the risks um, minimized. Um, looking at water efficiency, waste and recycling, uh, avoiding waste going into landfills and holes in the ground and how can it become more, we use recycled materials and then we continue to recycle those materials like closing the loop on waste. We're seeing golf clubs do really exciting things with energy, not just energy efficiency and lighting and heating, but renewable energy, solar panels on maintenance facilities and um, you know, wind turbines and um, car charging points in the car park for electric cars. Um, on the community side, as well as all the great health and well-being that golf provides, charitable giving, outreach, education, outdoor classrooms for environmental education. And then on the carbon side, we are seeing some just great work from golf clubs calculating their carbon emissions, reducing their carbon emissions, and also working out how much carbon is stored by the golf course itself. So that's that's the whole climate action area, like what's golf doing there? So across nature resources, climate and communities, there's just a lot of really, really good practical work taking place within the industry right now. And I have to say it's really exciting because it's accelerating. You know, over the last two, three years in particular, as sustainability post COVID, as sustainability has just gone up and up in people's awareness, something we really need to do. Uh, and we need to do it in this decade. It's really important. It's quite an urgent issue. A lot of these issues, golf is really stepping forward and it's accelerating at a time when we need, uh, we all need to sort of accelerate our efforts. You know? 
So that's Jonathan Smith giving us an idea about what they do at the GEO Foundation for Sustainable Golf. Obviously, a lot to take in there, Alex. A lot of ideas that he said that they're, they're doing, they're working with clubs. What are your thoughts on, on, on the type of things that they're doing and, and, and how important it is? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think he's, yeah, you know, Jonathan's covered a lot of areas there, um, all, of it, all of which are really important. Um, you know, from an England golf perspective, I think, you know, looking at, you know, how they define sustainability is meeting the needs of the present without compromising the needs of the futures, uh, of the future to, to meet theirs. Um, that's kind of, that captures um, the essence of what, what those actions will do. Um, and I think looking at environmental responsibility, um, you know, social progress and economic activity, tying those all together um, is really important to, to allow local communities to thrive um, and, and golf courses can, can drive that activity. Um, so I, I've looked at the sustainability.golf page. Um, they've got hundreds of, of case studies uh, available, um, you know, be it charity events or you know, enhancing you know, heather growth, for example. Um, I actually found found one about the, the Golf National, um, one of the 607 uh, golf courses in France, just to uh, <laughs> give, give the audience a, a cheeky stat there. Um, they were looking at recycling green waste um, to create wild islands in wetland areas, which, which boost up biodiversity. Um, allowing species like you know, frogs and snakes to thrive, um, enriching that local biodiversity. And this, this is you know, a way to, to recycle, but also um, to, to reduce waste, but also uh, look at ways to, to, to allow species to thrive. So it's sort of most of the actions you can take can have multiple benefits, beneficial effects. Um, and that's where you know, I think taking, taking the action can, can really make it a huge difference, um, you know, even, even on a small scale. So, yes. Yeah, we will, we will come to what you've specifically done yourself with England Golf, but I just wanted to bring, bring Jonathan back in. The question I asked him was how important is it the next generation get involved in this process as well? Let's just hear from Jonathan. First of all, it's really important for, the, I guess, the generation of people that um, make decisions about golf and clubs and more generally to think about future generations. I mean, this is about the sort of future resilience and success of the sport of golf, because there are some of those sustainability issues that are out there are challenges for the golf industry, droughts, flooding, um, regulation around chemicals. How will we maintain really good playing conditions if we don't have some of the products that we currently need to manage those golf courses? Uh, public perception, pressure on land, for nature, we are seeing some examples where you know people are saying, "Why don't we turn our golf course into a nature reserve?" Without currently understanding that it it actually does perform, you know, like a, a nature reserve. So there are some pressures here, and so golf getting involved in sustainability is about protecting the future of the game, its success and its growth and its kind of resilience and how you know in a hundred years time how good is golf going to be in a world that's become even more preoccupied with sustainability but it's as you say it's also really about you know if golf becomes more sustainable now it's looking after the green spaces that we need it's looking after the biodiversity it's protecting the water quality it's making sure there's enough water for you know us to drink and to irrigate crops and to use on golf courses so it's about making a, a difference um, for the next generation. So I think that's the, the big thing now. And I think we can see that in golf, you know, golf really taking on board that responsibility that it has, as well as its opportunity to um, to be at the forefront. But it, it would be fantastic to um, also think about how, you know, young golfers now and the families that golf is working hard to bring in, you know, can can be part of that movement and be part of helping golf on this journey. Um, because, uh, you know, we know from 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 uh, uh, studies, you know, attitudinal studies that young people are very concerned about the environment. They're they, they know that um, we depend that the society and the human beings depend on the environment in much, much like sharper focus than than, you know, our generation understood that. So it would be great to get some of their ideas and some of their concerns into the mix. Uh, and to hear some of that uh, in terms of what they would hope that golf would look like, you know, in, in the decades ahead and what and actually be proud in what golf can help contribute to the whole global sustainability movement in the decades ahead. Um, and there's some practical things, of course, that every golfer can do and, and every young golfer in junior golf section could do. 
I just wonder, Alex, do you think there's been a bit of a wake-up call, even even this last summer, which has been very hot, there's been periods whereby you know, both Ian and myself have been on golf courses whereby we've barely seen a, any green at all. It's been brown or, or yellow and white at times kind of thing. Do you think there's been a bit of a wake-up call that people are starting to realise that this is not just a one-off thing, this could be a continuous thing unless we do something about it? Yep, uh, yeah, I agree with that. I think that... Um there's lots that, that can be done um firstly it's about awareness so understanding that you're not going to have you know a, a pure kind of luscious green golf course all year round that's a it's unattainable um and it's an unrealistic expectation so i think yeah it's, it's great that people, if people start to think like that and think oh, actually hold on a second this, this could be a longer lasting effect and it's not just going to be this summer that i have you know brown fairways or, or burnout you know areas of, of the course um you know i think it's something that the that we've done as, as young ambassadors this year over the summer as you say it was very hot so what we um there are 18 of us on the program and we were all given a reusable water bottle um and then we tracked our usage over over august um so i think yeah, the average was 44 uh, times per ambassador through the month um so we saved some i think 792 plastic water bottles um so if you do the math and you have a club of a thousand members, you know, on a monthly basis, a club could save 44,000 bottles per month. So not only, you know, so you'll say you're reducing your, your plastic waste consumption, for example. Um, and that's one way in which you can look at, you know, introducing kind of methods to, to, to reduce your consumption within your golf, within the golf club. Um, and it's in the interest of every golfer to do that, not only junior golfers, um, uh, and ultimately allowing golf to be more sustainable uh, and lead in, that, in leading this space. Have you had that conversation with golf clubs? Have you explained that story to golf clubs? And what's their reaction been when you've, when you've explained those statistics to them? Uh, so I've not, I mean, I've, in my golf club, we, um, we already have reusable water bottles available in the pro shop. Um, so again, it's trying to move away from buying your one pound water bottle. It's plastic you know, from the fridge. It's about going and still supporting your local pro and buying a, you know, a branded for your club um, reusable water bottle. Um, you know, having, do have those conversations at, um, you know, to increase the number of water stations on the course, um, and just encouraging that that kind that re, that reuse and, and recycle attitude towards um, towards consumption. Um, and and the, you know, this is a slightly different example to, to talking about sort of Browning fairways, but um, you know, it's it's one way in which you can you can make a difference, and it's part of understanding what can you do on you know individually that can then help towards you know the, the wider picture, which is the golf course, the golf club, you know, the clubhouse. Um, and sort of looking at the bigger picture as well. So, um, I suppose the key question I was trying to get out there is: is 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 our golf clubs listening to the junior golfers when they when they come with practical examples and say, "Look, here's the facts. This is what happens." Surely, you know, you would hope that common sense kicks in and they would go, "Actually, you're right in what you say there." Are they actually listening? That's the key, isn't it? Yeah, I think I mean junior golfers need to, need to be heard, and and that's what I sort of alluded to earlier is that you know junior golfers need to be need to have the platform. Um, so, you know, your junior captains, your, your vice captains, they, it'd be great for them to have to ensure golf clubs to ensure that they have a position on their golf club committee so they can be part of the conversation. So they can bring it to the table and say, look, we did this or, or our juniors want to, to do this as well. So it's not just a young ambassador program with England Golf that does it. It's every junior section. If they can you know, run a case study for their club and say, look, we're all using reusable water bottles why don't you do it or, or can you go and do it or just give it a go because it's about yeah, starting those conversations and being heard um, and so by leading, leading by example um, as, a, as a junior section is a, is a great way to start influencing that change. And if and if, if, if golf clubs are watching this we're, go, we're going to bring Jonathan Smith in here because I asked him this question if, if anyone is looking for an inspiration out there as far as a, a youngster who can influence not just locally nationally but the world i think greta thorberg is the, is the perfect example and, and the question i put to, to jonathan is how much of an inspiration is she to all youngsters out there let's hear from jonathan absolutely have to you know hear those voices and it's and it's inspirational actually i think to see um you know so many young people expressing their concerns and asking you know current generation decision makers to to, to think slightly differently and to to maybe show a bit more care for the environment is what's being asked. Um, so uh, no, I think that I think that's fantastic, and I, I could see that you know uh, in in golf clubs, you know, junior golfers could there's there's absolute reason why they shouldn't have a voice in their clubs. 
And I mean, some of the things that they could do would be, for example, to encourage their clubs and advocate for uh, maybe ask the question, is there any more nature we could have on our golf course? There, there quite often is a little space here or there for a bit more nature. Now, that's not to decry the great work that greenkeepers do and a lot of golf clubs already do. But but if you look with a slightly different eye at the golf landscape, you quite often find a little bit more space for nature. So without being too pushy about it and without trying to slow down rounds of golf and lose more golf balls, that would be quite an interesting place for golf clubs to look at and maybe, you know, aided by, by junior golfers. Um, you know, where could we see a bit more nature on the course? The other one that um, all golfers can help with, including junior golfers, is a bit of, um, I would say it's a bit of kindness towards your greenkeeper. It's not easy to provide perfect playing conditions 12 months of the year in the kinds of climate that we have. So, um, I think we all need to show a bit more care and concern for course managers that they are really, you know, they're delivering a lot with more and more pressures. Um, so asking questions about why the golf course looks like that and um, rolling with the seasons, uh, not being too fussy if there's a little bobble on a putt or the greens are running that little bit slower than you might per personally like. I think there's a bit of around around the way that turf is presented and the golf course presented. There are things that golfers can do. But junior golfers could actually lead some of that ethos towards their course managers, I think would be quite nice. And then, of course, there's very practical things that golfers can do. Look out for the latest recycled polo shirts. Look out for the golf tees that biodegrade. Uh, look out for the golf shoes that are made out of, you know, 70, 80, 90 percent recycled plastics and rubbers, like some of the, the brands that are out there. Um, car share carry a water bottle and refill it, ask your club if they can help with some more refilling points. Um, uh, sometimes asking about golf club storage and cycling to and from the club. It's a bit old fashioned, maybe in some ways, but you know, sometimes we've got to look backwards to look forwards. So I think um, there's there would be three things that I would call out for any golfer, but I think junior golfers could really help. Advocate for a bit of nature on the golf course. Um, be kind to your greenkeeper and think about some of the things that you buy and how you travel and also how you eat at the club. You know, are there any local things on the menu? What's, you know, how healthy is the menu? How seasonal is it? Those things really matter. A lot of the carbon emissions in the world come from food consumption, production. Again, how can a junior golfer maybe ask, well, where did this burger come from? And just see what answer they get. Hopefully it will be a local burger. Hopefully there'll be a vegetarian vegan burger option alongside it. So some interesting ideas there from 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 Jonathan about what juniors can do within their golf club. Are some of those ideas that, that that you've even considered yourself talking to your golf club about, Alex? Yeah. So well, luckily my golf club is already quite far ahead in terms of sustainability. Um, they're already running lots of different kind of programs. They use they, they don't use fertilizers, for example. These are um, a, bio, a, a natural biological uh, pesticide um, as opposed to anything that's sort of harsher and, and chemically driven. So. That's one thing they already do. Um, I think, you know, with starting conversations with other members is something that I've certainly done is, is having that conversation at, at the member level. Um, so targeting the membership and getting those conversations between people so that they do have a better understanding um, of, of why their golf course might be changing between seasons and why it's not perfect. Um, and, you know, for example, with, with England Golf, we, we had we had the pleasure of visiting uh, with visiting Wogan Golf Club. Um, we got to see all the work they're doing, for example. Um, and one way in which they're reducing their water water consumption is um, or what they have done, I should say, is they they um, did a survey on their on their local area and found a borehole. They've connected to that and then they've set up a reservoir um, and this reservoir can supply their golf course with enough water for over over a year um, if there was if there was a, a long term drought. Uh, we get plenty of rain in the UK anyway, but that, that is becoming more variable. Um, so that's that's one example of, of ways, in slightly bigger ways, perhaps that, that golf clubs can look to invest in in their course. Um, and you know, the key thing here is that you can make that investment initially. Um, but what they found was that after four or five years, um, they were saving the amount of costs they had saved had paid back that investment. Um, so you're looking at a financial saving here as well as a, a water saving. So you're, you're looking at an environmental and an economic benefit. And I think that's that's really you know, the key here um, is that you can, you can benefit financially as a club um, from, from making these investments in the short term 
um, for, for the long term benefit. And um, that was a really great learning point for me. Um, and it's something that I've used with conversations I've had with members at my club um, about you know what can what can a lo- local club do or a slightly smaller club that, that maybe hasn't got you know a big budget. Um, and it's, it's again looking looking at the suggestions from Jonathan about you know setting up smaller nature areas. Um, you know, just, just improving one corner of the course that doesn't get a lot of action. Um, you know, just, just ensure, ensuring that biodiversity, it can thrive in that area. Um, and and as, I, as I said already, there's, there's so many examples on the um, sustainability.golf website that, I, that I've looked at. Um, so it's not just looking at biodiversity, it's looking at things like exploring electric and hybrid golf course um, maintenance machinery. So you know, what, what are you cutting a grass with? Are you using, you know, are you using petrol or diesel machines? Or can you switch to hybrid or electric vehicles? And that was something that the Wobers is looking at doing as well. Um, and the other golf courses can, can start to talk about. So there's there's so many options available, um, as, as I keep saying, but it's, it's a case of going going and reading about it as well. So have those conversations that, that I'm having with, with fellow members and saying to people to go and, to go and read more about it because um, once you get kind of the membership on board with the idea, then you, you can really push the conversations into, into the onto the committee and, and make sure they can start making the changes um, on a tangible level. Now we've we've obviously okay keep on the air crash and the question of, of you t- approaching your golf club and talking to people within the golf industry is a question I, I I asked Jonathan this is is that what's the image of what's the image of the golf industry outside if you sort of mean I'll ask you the same question how do you feel that the the golf industry that the image of it to non golfers is as far as sustainability is concerned because in theory people must look at it and go well it's outside it must be good but but at the same time if I, I won't mention any names, but you know exactly what I'm talking about here. There's a former president out there who who gave golf a bad reputation. So, mm-hmm. and in particular with 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 his project up in Scotland, when he when he when he built a golf course up there. So, how do you see the golf industry's image within non-golfers? Yes, yeah, so I think this this touches on the sort of the social aspect of, of golf and trying to make golf more inclusive um, and accessible to, to a wide range of people. Um, I think there's, there's no point ignoring that you know, golf has traditionally been more elitist, um, whereas I think that's that's definitely changing now. Um, that the way I try to look at golf as an example of where where golf could go is, is to compare it to, to football. So. For those people that aren't looking, so I don't want to take away from, from look, talking about golf, but I think it's a great example because you look at football and they've got an amazing grassroots game. And so if you try and do that with, with golf, you're going to be able to introduce a lot more people to the game. Um, and it becomes, it becomes naturally more popular for people. It becomes more normal for them to, to try it at school um, with their friends in a more social context. Um, it becomes more accessible to people and it becomes more inclusive. Um, I think that that's that's one way in which we can golf can can start to change its perspective and go from being more tradition from its traditional view and perspective to non-golfers that it's it's not for me. Um, that kind of trying to make it more about you know bringing everyone into the game. That's really that's a really key a message to convey to people to change their perception on, on golf. Um, so that's you know that's one way in which I know, you know the Golf Foundation and Golf are working towards you know developing the grassroots game with, within. Um, within the UK um, and it's something that if we do globally as well that perception that negative perception perhaps can, can start to shift um, uh, and make golf more accessible yeah let's, let's let's hear from what Jonathan had to say when I put the question to him what kind of image the, the golf industry has one of the things that's driven golf's current work in sustainability has been an awareness that golf's image has not been very good um, and actually it's a shame because um, the re- one of the reasons golf image isn't very good is because you know the gen the public or environmental organizations often with good justification will highlight one golf development or one example of how bad golf is and then they'll use that to paint a picture that that's the whole sport and of course that's not i mean we'll travel around golf clubs and we see really dedicated you know golf clubs and club managers and uh, pj professionals and greenkeepers working together to make it more sustainable and to be a really good asset environmentally and socially in their community. It's inspiring that some of the things that you see in golf, but outside golf, a lot of people don't see that. They do just see the golf development that bulldozed a lot of land, that felled a lot of trees, that destroyed some mangrove swamps, uh, you know, mangrove coastline. 
um, they might see golf um, that's not been really very kind to communities. And, and by the way, this plays out in different ways, uh, shapes and sizes in different parts of the world. In the UK and Scot places like Scotland, we're kind of a little bit born and bred with golf. Um, so we can, you know, we just all live with golf. It's part of it's our, one of our national sports and, uh, you know, a great part of tourism. And it's something we're very proud of having helped develop and share with the world. But if you go to other countries, that's not the way that golf is perceived. Um, you don't have to go too far from the UK where golf is not necessarily seen as part and part of the fabric of the country or the culture. It's seen as something elite, separate, and sometimes environmentally damaging. Um, and I think so golf really does have to work on its image. And I think the best way of doing that is to get the stories out about all the good things that the grassroots of the game are doing and, and the way that the industry is working hard on this subject. Um, and that will help to start to temper, to uh, overcome what the current sort of message is, which is, you know, there's another bad project, another bad example, and that paints a picture for the whole industry. You know, we do need to we do need to do something about that. Now we'll come to you in the second ice, but I'm just going to put another point to to, to Jonathan, and then I'll get your views on exactly the, the question I also put to, to Jonathan was what role can juniors play? You used about the fact that you, you can use social media, so let's just and how you can influence people. Let's just hear Jonathan's thought on that, and, and then we'll bring you in, Alex. That is part of just creating uh, an awareness and actually a sort of feel good around golf and sustainability. Uh, that it's not just about science, it is about people understanding the subject, it's about people feeling uh, motivated and inspired. So I think, you know, I mean, the work that England Golf are doing with the ambassadors and bringing sustainability and education and sort of advocacy into that space is hugely valuable. Um, the Actually, the uh, DP World Tour and the Ladies European Tour have been working hard on engaging players like Suzanne uh, Peterson, the Solheim Cup. Uh, captain, but also um, Camille Chevalier. There's a few uh, uh, women professional golfers who are now stepping forward, what we call sustainable golf champions. Um, and then we're starting to see out, you know, Sky Sports commentators, uh, people in the media. Um, there's definitely an opportunity and, and um, a great, yeah, I mean, it'd just be great to see more people who have influence, you know, where golfers look to them for messages and ideas and sort of direction. If we could help them build some good sustainability content, you know, about, come on, let's look at golf's better with nature. Um, you know, um, let's not let's not contribute to plastic pollution in the ocean. Um, let's champion golf. And, you know, how 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 much value does golf give in your local community? Any any more than it can do. Uh, come on, let's let's strive for some of these carbon reduction and net zero targets. Let's be part of that cleaner, greener world. Those, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing a few things, but there are some things that influencers could really help get out and reach lots of people. I think the key word there is influencers, and 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 as you well know, Alex is, is that influencers are, are associated that that word is associated with social media and obviously that is associated with with younger people so how important is it to use social media to benefit to, to try and get this message across yeah it's, it's so important um i don't think you can sort of overstate the importance of social media it's in everyone's most people's lives nowadays um, you know, particularly young people so you know, in the same way that golf reaches a lot of people um, across all ages so, so does social media so by joining the two together we can we can definitely start to push out the right messages about golf and start to drive that that, that change that that sustainability drive um i think that's that's you know, it's a great platform to use um, you know ask the young ambassadors we have our own platform that we can share what we do in you know, england golf the young the, the golf foundation um they've all got their own platforms to be sharing what's going on um so if you, if you go and follow them and you keep up to date with with what's going on in, in their world uh, which is you know, as a golfer that your golfing world as well um that's a great opportunity to learn and to understand more about about what's happening um and i think this sort of you know this ties in with looking to inspire others and make positive change um and as i said before as golf's got a global reach um as the social media it's, it's a no-brainer to, to use um to use social media and, and by bringing young people together with with influencers um who have a bigger platform 
um, you know, to champion golf, as, as Jonathan said, and, and really add that value, then I, I think there's, there's no other way to, well, there, there are multiple ways to do it, but this is a great way to do it. Uh, and this, this message is, is really about collaboration um, and the opportunity to work together. So, yeah. I, I and actually, two, two points on that. One, one thing which Jonathan mentioned there, using former players as well, so using people who, who have an influence in the sense that their name is already out there, you know, Suzanne Pedersen, who's, who's, who's next year's Solheim Cup captain, was the name that Jonathan mentioned there as well. But also going back to my point a little earlier is the fact that, you know, you're not just targeting the people within the golf industry. You can target people who aren't within the golf industry. And obviously, you, when you're on social media, you know, I don't know how many people are within your social media network, but perhaps more than half of them may not play golf kind of thing. So you can get that message across to people who aren't within the industry and try and give a more positive impression of what the golf industry is all about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, reaching out to people and getting that, getting those messages out to, to non-golfers as well is is part of driving that that kind of that change, that culture change within within the golfing world and the industry, um, to ensure that it is more accessible. And you know, and you might hear about you know opportunities to go and try out golf at your local club, for example, through social media. And if you're, if a, you know, the local club's got a got a session on on a Saturday morning, you know, you can, you know, a young person might see that and then go, oh, actually, ask mum and dad to, to take them up on the, to the club on, on the weekend. And, you know, I think that's the other great thing about, you know, bringing juniors into the, to the game um, through through social media is that it also can touch the, the, the parents or the guardians as well, because, you know, with junior golfers, you, you, you depend on your, your, your parent or your guardian to, to come into the, to come and support you, which brings them into the conversation as well. So you're really kind of getting two birds of one stone by, by trying to promote to, to non-golfers as well as golfers and bring as many people into the into the kind of into the picture um and, and start understanding that the golf is trying to make a positive impact um you know environmentally socially um uh, as well as well you know sort of economically i suppose um so yeah now obviously i don't know whether you listen to the podcast we did a week ago but it was about junior opens and, and it's something which i i do myself i organize quite a few of those types of events kind of thing this is a point i raised when i was talking to jonathan about what advice would 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 i want to what could he give me as if i was a golf club about how to make some of these events more sustainable and the message that, that, that they can pass on let's hear what jonathan had to say about this from large events like uh, Ryder Cup, the Open Championship, Green Links, uh, through the RNA, has done a huge amount at large events, DP World Tour, Rolex Series. There's a lot happening at the large event side. At the smaller events, I mean, you take just some of the same principles and you apply them in a smaller scale. We talk about the, the venue itself, the staging of the event, the communications to the people who are at the event, and we actually talk a little bit about the legacies that even a small event can have, the sort of ripple effect that can have. So that's how we approach a golf tournament. And we sort of, uh, within that, so the venue, um, tell the story about the nature that's on the golf course, have a little nature trail that's running, have a little, have an education day that's linked, or an education hour that's linked to the event for all the participants in the event. There's a fantastic event in Italy called the Venice Open. It's run with the US uh, Kids Foundation. They have packed environmental education into almost every part of that event from the time that the children and the families arrive to the time they depart with any sort of like uh, little sustainable gifts and, and mementos that they take with them. The, the mums and dads and the, 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 um, the, the guardians uh, get environmental education on arrival. The kids do an environmental scorecard before they go out and play their round which tells them a bit about what to expect while they're playing. Um, everything is reused and recycled. Uh, the transports, all local hotels that are accredited by uh, for the sustainability standards that they have. Um, the water and hydration, there's nothing that's plastic, uh, is zero waste. What else are they doing? They're calculating the carbon emissions using some tools that we've provided uh, to them. Um, they do some carbon offsetting. So um, if they've got unavoidable emissions, they do legacy projects with local environmental groups and they provide some funding from the project, from the golf tournament into that tree planting or um, some other uh, type of uh, environmental restoration project. So they are, that's a really good example. And that's the venue that's making it happen, Montecchia Golf Club. And then the organizers, US Kids Foundation have bought into the whole thing. Uh, they, they speak to the, all the suppliers and contractors. Where does the food come from? Uh, where are the golf tees coming from? 
what kind of buses are they using? Uh, and they just and they, they've done that for about four years. And each year they didn't say we're not going to do this because we can't do it all. They just started small and each year they added a few more things in. And it's now become a, a really actually a bit of a showcase for a small amateur event, I would say. That's the Venice Open. And I think there's a case study about it on our website people who walk away from that event will go wow that was different so it's more exciting to be a part of it they've just they've infused it into the event it, it's part of the it's just part of the identity and part of the experience of going to that tournament and being part of that tournament is that it's greener and it's more responsible and it's more sustainable um the, there's nothing preachy about it i mean this is where the, you know the the sustainability there is a whole science to it and it's quite complex and i guess people in organizations like ours have to deal with the complexity but um event organizers and clubs can you know they can sort of if we can make it simpler for them take some of the complexity out and just make it about practical things if they can then pass that on in a non-preachy way in an engaging way to the players that come to their tournaments or their members or even ripple it out into the community um that's that you know that's when we're really going to start winning i think and 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 you know that that that's when the image of golf will change because there'll just be so many good stories and so many good examples of golf embracing sustainably it will be credible because it will be attached to some bigger things um but it it also needs to be really light and engaging and very simple and practical at the other end. Um, I mean, everything I've just described, for example, over the last sort of 10, 15 minutes, um, everything in nature, resources, climate communities, it's all traceable back to things like the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So you go from a local event like Montecchia or any you know local event in the UK, um, amateur event, some of those things that those clubs and those event organizers can help achieve, you can track right back to protecting life on land, um, sustainable communities, uh, climate action. Uh, I'll get a bit technical here. Sustainable production and consumption, um, uh, equality, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, some of the big things that the whole world is kind of wrestling with. Um, but yeah, you know, given that golf is, you know, millions of people uh, playing at tens of thousands of golf facilities and at hundreds, if not thousands of golf tournaments, just imagine all of that rippled down right to the sort of like the detailed end of things. And all of those sort of, I guess, um, uh, do one thing type actions were happening. That stacks up to, you know, golf being really positive force in sustainability and that's not where a lot of the outside world thinks golf is or where golf can even be uh, they think golf is you know maybe doesn't have that opportunity or can't be a positive force but but it absolutely can yeah i hope that is the case i'll just give an example um of alex of, of, of something which i always do at a golf course i don't know whether you do the same thing but i don't have any tees in my bag and basically, I just go to a tee and I just find one on the floor. And I just think to myself, I'm sure I can find a small one. If if I can't find a big one to hit a driver, I'll just hit a, you know, a, a rescue or whatever, just so I can keep the ball in play. And sooner or later, I'll find a big tee and I'll use that for the rest of my round. And it just saves me having to buy tees. It means that I'm recycling the tees which are out there kind of thing. Very, very simple, practical. I did that around the golf with someone recently and they took the mickey out of me for most of the round the fact that i was doing it but i couldn't care less because it was just it was just my little way of doing things and that's that was the point that jonathan made there it can be little things that you do but when they build up it suddenly becomes the norm doesn't it yeah absolutely yeah it's, it's about changing those the little behaviors in your own way of playing golf and, and engaging with sustainability um right through to the club level so you know i i, I do the same you know I'm, a couple of my friends you know they, they always you know, they, they know I don't have teas in my bag, or I only have a few. I keep a few of the castle teas, you know, that, that last quite a while, and um, they're, they're maybe not that sustainable because they're plastic. But you can get bamboo teas, you can get biodegradable teas. There are obviously sustainable options out there. Um, but yeah, I think that's a, it's a great way to, to you know to reuse um, and recycle what, what other people tend to just leave lying around. So um, it's definitely not a bad idea. And I think you know going back to what, what Jonathan said about looking at events and what do events do and tournaments, you know, I think. A few years ago at the open i was i was there and 
you know, seeing that the refill stations are there available to people. Um, you know, the same thing at, at Wentworth this year, they had the same thing. Um, and I think there's, so there's, there's the right, you know, the small things you can do. And there's also the, you know, the things that events and tournaments are doing as well as, you know, clubs. Um, so I, yeah, there's, there's, yeah, as you say, there's everything, everyone can do one little thing and it's not necessarily saying we don't even want, we don't want to say to clubs, you know, go away and, and make 10 pledges and, and make sure you get all of them done in the next two years. It's about taking the small steps, you know, individually as a club and, and nationally and internationally. And I think, you know, although we want to accelerate the change and that's what you know, GEO for, for sustainable golf is all about, um, but it's accelerating it over a realistic time period. Um, so it really involves individual responsibility as well as club and, and sort of club responsibility and, and national sort of bodies to, to come into the picture. Um, yeah, so I, interesting point, Steve, because I'm not too dissimilar. <laughs> <laughs> we're, 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 we're cut from the same cloth by the sounds of it so right we are we are coming to the end of this podcast here so we're just going to get uh just one final question which i put to jonathan and that's just to give some contact details if anyone wants to find out a little bit more about the geo foundation for sustainable golf so let's just hear those from jonathan everything's at uh, sustainable.golf and uh most of our social media is around at sustainable golf uh, or hashtag for sustainable golf so just google sustainable golf and, and you'll find us and then on our website there's quite a lot of uh, uh guidance there's ideas there is sustainable.golf forward slash highlights that's where the it's a bit like pinterest for sustainable golf so if you want to see what individual clubs are doing they're creating highlights we curate them we press share and they go up into the whole gallery of sustainable golf highlights there's also a sustainable golf map and directory you can find out if your club is participating or which clubs round about you are participating so um and uh hello at sustainable.golf all and any questions queries opinions uh critique of our work anything like that is welcomed uh it's a difficult you know sustainability is not an exact science nobody gets it right 100 percent of the time uh, there's quite a lot of trial and error and things, and we're very much open for that side of the conversation. You know, if there's if there's a hard thing, hard nut to crack, let's talk about what the nut is and how we can crack it. And I'd certainly recommend anyone get in touch with them as well to get some ideas as well. With yourself, Alex, obviously you, you, you're an ambassador and part of England Golf as well. Just just to give some contact details if anyone who wants to get in touch with England Golf or, and, and find out about what you can do as far as sustainability of golf is concerned, if you've got some details for us. Yeah, yeah, I've got some details for you. Um, I just wanted to kind of just just before I do that, just bounce off what, what Jonathan's just said. And I think it's you know it's about trial and error at this stage. You know, it's not an exact science. Um, you know, you can learn from from your own projects. If they don't go well, you can learn from those, and so can others. And that's where you know sharing what you do through the uh, resources available um, through through GEO Foundation. Um, I think that's it's really important to to take it on and don't be afraid of failing because it's all about trying to make a positive impact. Um, and then there's also plenty of information, as Jonathan said, available ready to, to, to learn from and go and do the same thing. Um, in terms of trying to, uh, to give you some more information uh, on, on, the England, on England Golf, the Golf Foundation and the Young Ambassador Programme, um, you can find us on Instagram, um, it's england.golf. Um, there's the Golf Ambassadors, which is Golf Ambassadors. Uh, and you can also find the Golf Foundation, which is golf underscore foundation underscore org. Um, and Please use the hashtag sustainability drive um, that's uh, you'll find some content uh, associated with that hashtag on, on the social medias um, available um, and then lastly um, in golf have introduced um, a sort of a, a guide to the sustainability drive um, which is a plan from 2022 to 2025 um, and it, it, it outlines all the guidelines for for, for local clubs to to look at uh, and integ integrate into their plans and how they might look at introducing sustainability um, and embed it within what they want to do on a on, a, on an annual basis um, so definitely have a look at that as well it's, it's a great resource so no one's got any excuses now have they we've, we've given them all the information that they need we've given them some ideas and tips and 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 uh, of how we can hopefully make this sport better more sustainable for, for years to come um Thanks very much for coming on the show, Alex. Really appreciate all your all your help and comments. Also, thanks very much for for Jonathan for giving us a, a, a massive background there of what the GEA Foundation for Sustainable Golf is all about. Just mention one of the next podcast coming up in two weeks' time. So we're going to be talking to Sir Nick Faldo. So anyone who has any questions at all 
uh, for some Nick. Uh, be interesting to ask him about because he is a golf course designer, of course. Um, so we're interested to, to get his views on, on what he has been doing with sustainable golf with the courses that he's looking to um, to build as well. So that's something which which I'm sure we'll um, we'll talk to him about as well. Um, but if anyone has any other questions for, for him, please get in touch and we'll, we'll pass those on. That'll be on the podcast in a couple of weeks time. Thanks very much, Alex. Thanks very much, Jonathan. And thanks very much for everyone else for watching. And uh, good evening. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Jonathan. And thanks, Ian, as well.